I realised when I was preparing for this talk that it's four years since I was last in this room. And, of course, something rather minor has got in the way for the last three or four years that has uh, completely turned our lives upside down. But as Mark says, we're really trying hard with the clinics, with the patients, to get back to how we were. Um, I see many familiar faces around here. You'll know that I love to see people in the clinic. I hope it's old-fashioned. I can't bear the telephone. So if I've spoken to you on the telephone for only three minutes instead of a nice quarter of an hour chat in clinic, I apologise. So that's how I start. Now... Giving a patient talk is always a bit of a challenge because in this room there'll be people relatively new on the CLL journey. There'll also be people who have had CLL for a long time. There are some people who are really into the academic side and of course working in Cambridge I'm very familiar with professors who come into my clinic and within a month of Diagnosis X they genuinely know an awful lot about that condition and we have actually quite I nearly said fun, but rewarding banter and exchange and development of ideas. So there are definitely a lot of CLL experts. And so therefore, getting the balance in the talk is always a challenge. What I do is I tend to give half of the talk a more sort of introductory thing, a little bit about CLL overview. And then the second half of the talk does get into quite a bit of detailed therapeutics and where we're going. The joy of the way uh, Mark Lewis, the way they set this up, is because it's going to be recorded and online and you'll have access to it all, people, I've had many patients who say, you know, we sit down, we'll do 10 minutes. Sit there, gin and tonic, watch 10 minutes, that's enough. Come back the next night, do another 10 minutes. So, uh, or a cup of tea, of course. All doctors are meant to say, don't drink anymore. So... Uh, whenever you give a talk, you have a potential conflict of interest. So I do work closely with the pharmaceutical industry in various different guises, lecturing advisory boards. I do also work in the non-NHS sector, and some of the therapeutics I'll talk about are not uh, currently NHS commissioned. So we're going to split it like this. We're going to do an overview of leukaemia and CLL, advances in laboratory analysis, and then supportive care and therapy. When I looked at the talk I gave four years ago, I realised that there's a lot of slide overlap to start with, and then it all suddenly changes. And it's amazing. The world of CLL has truly changed. And actually, from one point in the middle of the talk, I use none of my old slides at all, which is quite remarkable. So to recap, what is leukaemia? Leukaemia is a cancer of white cells. We all have this array of white cells that develop in the bone marrow and they're part of our immune system. It's how mammals have evolved to fight off pathogens. You have all of this lot down here, neutrophils, granulocytes, these reactive things that fight off bacterial infection. And these are the primitive part of the immune system that a bug gets into your bloodstream and out goes these attack cells. They're short-lived. I don't want to say they're pretty basic. But evolutionary, they're pretty basic. They just attack, secrete toxins, kill off bug. That's what your neutrophils and that lot does. The lymphocytes, they're much more specialised. And we have the B cells that make immunoglobulins. And through the COVID pandemic, we all became experts on vaccination and immunoglobulins and serology response. And that's all about your B cells mounting a response to a special pathogen. The T cells, they're the other broad arm of the lymphoid system, and they help the B cells. They're like helpers, but they also are part of attacking viruses and things. So these are the more complex, evolved part of our immune system. And because blood is highly complicated, these things can go wrong. And broadly, if something goes wrong in that section of your blood system, we call it a myeloid disorder... And if something goes wrong in that side of the blood system, we call it a lymphoid disorder. And we have this broad term that you'd have heard about when we talk about chronic and acute. Chronic is something that grumbles over time. So chronic means long-lasting. And acute is something that happens very quickly. So when we talk about myeloid leukaemia, acute myeloid leukaemia, these are the people who can be completely well, on holiday, absolutely fine, and within four weeks, they're in Adam Brooks in a bit of a mess because all of their blood system has failed and the cells have raced away. So the acute move very quickly. The chronic tend to move slowly. And of course, chronic lymphocytic leukaemia 
is the defining chronic slow-moving leukemia. For many people, chronic lymphocytic leukemia grumbles for years, decades, without anything changing, particularly clinically. Now, of course, it's more complex than that because CLL is also a disease of progressive immune failure because people with CLL over years start to lose their ability to mount normal responses to pathogens. So we see that people get more infections, but CLL is the one that moves the most slowly. Chronic myeloid leukemia is a bit of a halfway house. That one, which we won't talk about, moves slowly, but over one, two, three years can make people quite ill. So that's how we broadly classify the leukemias. But today we're talking about CLL. And CLL, it's the commonest leukemia in the Western world. If you go hunting for it and you take blood tests on people over 60, over 70, and you do detailed tests in the lab, flow cytometry, hunting out tiny low levels of this cells, you can find it in 1% of people. Some data sets say 10, even 20% if you lose, use super sensitive tests. Now that isn't a disease, of course. That must be considered part of the natural aging process. And there's a whole separate lecture you can give on how the blood system ages. It's all a bit depressing because the whole aging process. That's it. And looking at the old films, I've realised this. I looked to myself four years ago and I thought, wow, I was young and enthusiastic. <laughs> now I listen to the budget and worry about the pension. <laughs> anyway. It's part of that ageing accumulation of these, what we call clonal B cells. And the word clonal, which haematologists love throwing around, <coughs> it just means it has evolved from a mother cell. Polyclonal means you have lots of cells that are all genetically unrelated. But clonal means you'll have one cell where something bad has happened at a DNA level and it expands and it differentiates and grows. And so one cell becomes 100, becomes 100,000, becomes 100 million. And they're all derived from that same one. And that's this classic clonal side of cancer. So we call them clones. So clonal accumulation of leukemic B cells. And they pack out the bone marrow and they swell lymph nodes as they move around the body. And they have typical features in the laboratory that we can look at and define somebody as having CLL by these codes. You might have seen them on some of your letters or path reports. And this CD5 positive, 23 positive, this is just a language used by our laboratory colleagues that tells us which proteins are expressed on the surface of the cell. And it's a code. We've got to give them letters because we can't give them long names. So, sorry, give them num numbers. So CLL has this classic CD5 pos, 23 pos. Cousins of CLL, mantle cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, marginal zone lymphoma, they all have their own different code. And because they behave different biologically and they respond differently for treatments, that's why we have to classify them. But that's what those numbers mean. They're just referring to the different proteins. So the CLL patient, the typical patient, well, um, typically they present uh, as older age, males a bit more than females. There are family clusters, and that causes a lot of stress for our patients. Um, if you have a first-degree relative who's had leukemia, myeloma, any of these disorders, there is a four-fold higher risk. And if you start clustering in families, that four-fold becomes 16-fold. So you can see where that stress builds. But as I always say to patients, if you arbitrarily take something, you say, a lifetime risk of CLL, and these are not exact figures, I'm doing it for ease of maths, but say one in 4,000 is a lifetime chance, and you have a four-fold higher risk, that means you're first degree relative has a one in a thousand chance. That means 999 chance in a thousand they don't. And so you've always got to be careful with statistics because they can create a lot of stress. But as I say to my patient, they say, my son's 26, he's about to get married, he's setting up a company, should he go and get himself tested? And I say, is he well and working 16 hours a day? And I said, yes, don't go near a doctor. We love to medicalize people. If he's well, just don't test. That's my personal philosophy. You can go to a doctor if you're unwell. <laughs> you always worry because it goes online and say, that bloke follows from Cambridge. He said, avoid all doctors at all costs. Um, we know many people with CLL are found by chance. 
you go to your well man clinic. And the classic is a bloke who's retired. He says, I haven't been to a doctor for 20 years. And his wife says, go and get yourself checked out. So they go and get checked out and they find a lymphocyte count of seven. And all of a sudden, the world falls apart. Because instead of worrying about the golf tour, he's now convinced he's going to be in Adam Brooks on chemotherapy within a week. And of course, it is a huge transition to move through. And we will touch on that as how you can bring someone to an understanding of what CLL is and how you can bring a patient to understand that their life is them. You're your retired executive playing golf, working on charity commissions. You're not a CLL patient. You have to, I quite strongly believe in this, you've got to work out how you can get that to one side that you deal with and you have their teams to help you deal with it, but it doesn't define who you are. And CLL, as I've touched on, can be benign for some patients. Of course, there are unlucky people where CLL moves faster, and we're going to touch on that in terms of the genetics. The last time I gave this talk, I had a picture of a cat and a tiger. But I thought I'd change the talk. So I went online and thought, who is your CLL patient going to? This is not what's their character like, let me stress. This is what is their disease like. Are they the puppy? They're absolutely fine, you know? Or are they this wolf that you've really got to be a bit careful of and pay much more attention to? And part of coming through the clinic and working out a bit about them, how they are, and if required, the molecular background can perhaps help separate, separate these patients out. Because we talked about the incidental finding, but patients can, of course, have these systemic symptoms tiredness is such a challenge for CLL patients and sometimes you end up giving stage A patients a trial of therapy if you have exhausted everything but you can be caught out by tiredness last year I had a great case of a patient who had been agonising about the CLL and whether we were going to start treatment and he came into the clinic so we had a lot of chats last time and he says well you know since my GP started the metformin I'm feeling much better I said, metformin? He says, turned out I've got diabetes and no one had picked up on it. And it was a good reminder to me that general medicine is general medicine. There are lots of things that can make people feel tired and washed out, and it's not just CLL. So it's a very non-specific symptom that really does need a bit of thought. Of course, losing weight unexpectedly is what we call a red flag symptom. And if you have a patient who's losing weight, then they need to be thought about. Night sweats, oh my goodness, night sweats are a really challenging symptom. We're all allowed to have the odd night sweat. You can have a night sweat randomly. You can have a night sweat with a viral infection. You can have a curry, you can drink too much beer. <laughs> and let me not get in trouble for saying it, but women in a certain age group, up to 20% can have night sweats for quite a protracted period. And so night sweats are a challenge. But, of course, if there is a changing pattern or something that's truly interrupting someone's quality of life and they can't sleep and they're exhausted, then that might be, certainly might be an indication that their CLL needs more thought and possibly needs treatment. CLL can pack out the bone marrow and start to make people anemic, occasionally bleeding. Thankfully, that's quite uncommon with CLL and infections that we've talked about. CLL, as it gradually gets worse, makes people more prone to infections because the immune system gradually gets worse. The lymph nodes. Now, lymph nodes are very variable. You can have some people who come in with small volume lymph nodes and it does not bother them. But you can have other people who, you know, very understandably, they might have a prominent lymph node under their neck and they say, oh, I'm not going to my church meetings, I won't go to the pub, I won't see my mates. Because of... And so that is something impacting on quality of life and that can influence whether or not you treat someone. And lymph nodes can be uncomfortable. If you're a keen cyclist and you can't flex and do all your pedalling because you've got prominent lymphadenopathy, that counts as a disease-related symptom that might need treatment. Splenomegaly. Sometimes spleens enlarge this way and don't cause much problems. Sometimes they seem to enlarge right across the abdomen and squash the stomach. They can act like a gastric band, and so people just stop eating big meals and often it's the other half will say, well, I've noticed, he, you know, he used to eat loads and now he just eats these little meals and he pecks at them and he says, well, I just feel full. And you scan them or ideally examine them. Let's not overwhelm our radiology colleagues. You examine them, find the big spleen and think, well, look, that might be a reason to treat. And spleen sometimes can become painful. 
at the worst extreme, people can get splenic infarcts when they actually cut off the blood supply to little bits of the spleen, and it can be quite sharply painful. So in the clinic, we're often asking about spleen-related symptoms and the infections that we've talked about. CLL can do strange things with the immune system, and there will, in this room, statistically, be people, and certainly people online, who have had these autoimmune manifestations. Autoimmune hemolysis is the commonest, when, for some reason, your immune system turns in on itself and starts to chop up your red cells. It can do the same to platelets, and sometimes it can do strange things in the skin, odd rashes. Years ago, I remember a patient who had lesions all around his lower legs and the poor cat had been kicked out, everything had been kicked out. And it was only when we treated his CLL and these things just disappeared that he finally believed it wasn't a household flea infestation that was not affecting anyone else in the house and only this poor patient. But it's a reminder that sometimes CLL just does strange things. So when we meet that patient in the clinic, this very different thing, will CLL shorten my life? How long have I got, doc? Very difficult question when you first meet someone. And if you meet someone who lumbers into clinic, drinking 10 pints a day, 20 Benson and Edgers, and they sit there with early stage CLL and say, how long have I got, doc? And you're wanting to say to them, you are not going to die from CLL. <laughs> if I was an actuary, CLL would not be on my top 10. But then you have other people, 50-year-old fit professional, and they'll sit there saying, you know, should I sell my business? Should I be cashing pension plans? And people, my patients often have very open conversations with me. Um, should I keep trying to work? Should I stop working? And it is sometimes quite a challenging thing to come up with truly, truly definitive answers. And one of the challenges, even when you start doing molecular testing and things, these can be prognostic in a broader sense, so you can say, from 100 patients, you know, 30 might do this, 60 might do that, 10 might do that. But at that individual predictive level, can you predict for that individual? It's actually quite hard. It's one of the challenges of medicine. Whole population prognostic definitions versus individual person sat in front of you. Will CLL make me unwell? But... The world of CLL has changed. And I'm just, before I go on to the molecular side, just to try and raise the spirits, because this is what CLL was. This is when I was in Leeds as a keen registrar with Pete Hillman, who was my guiding light in my early days. And we were recruiting into this trial. This was before Rituximab came along. And Kaplan-Meier plots, if you're not used to them, doctors love Kaplan-Meier plots, because it asks the question, if you start at year zero, when 100% of people are alive, and then you go to year 10, year 6, and you ask the question, how many people are alive? So when I was a registrar, if you were starting treatment with CLL, so you must remember this is people unwell enough to start treatment, if you track that curve across, you see by six years, about half of people had died. And these were fit young people going into a trial that you could have fludarabin. With the German trial that defined FCR as the standard of care, so some of you in this room may well have had FCR, and we look at the statistics there, and this is all old data, but you'll see at four years, about 20% of patients have died, about 80% alive. And these are really super fit young Germans, average age 61. They had almost no comorbidities. You had to be properly fit to go into that trial. And look how the world has changed. I'm going to tell you, show you two plots. We're going to talk a bit more about therapeutics later on. But this, for those of you back who can't see, is the five-year point. And if you look, median age 70, median age 72. So these are old people trials. And if you go onto the UK life tables, sorry to say that word, I saw some <laughs> smiles in the audience. In our world. <laughs> I'll be a terrible patient when I get to 70. I'll be... Re <laughs> anyway, if I get to 70. So, median age 70. If you go to the UK life tables, you can see that when this trial was recruiting, and you say, how long should a 70-year-old live, uh, and what percentage are alive at five years? 85%. So you have a benchmark saying, actually, if you're a population base, 85% of 70-year-olds will be alive at five years. 
If you say 72-year-olds, which is the median age of this trial, 84% will be alive at five years. So when you look at these survivals and you see acalabrutinib, 84%, venetoclax, venetuzumab, 82%, these are really close to age match survivals. So it's totally different, isn't it, from how it used to be? Because that is going like that. Now, of course, we don't have as long follow-up on the modern trials, but the world has really changed. I mean, acalorabinutuzumab, which for whatever reason isn't commissioned in the NHS, you've got survival there that's better than age-matched natural population survival. Is that just a statistical quirk? Hmm, probably. But anyway, it's, it's basically a much better news story. So I've mentioned that there are prognostic factors. There are more detailed things we can do in the laboratory to sort these things out. And I ask this question, is it a good or a bad thing to know? And I do like to have a proper conversation with the patient before we start doing molecular testing. Because I, obviously, I've run the CLR clinic for nearly 20 years, so I've seen examples where you'll have a happy, positive person with their lymphocyte count of 15, they persuade me to do the tests, and you find a bad marker. And even if you say to them, look, on an individual level, a bad marker might not mean badness for you, but I'm telling you, once you've found something bad in medicine, it's really hard to persuade a human being that it isn't bad for them, or it might not be bad for them, because you just don't know. So I always say to patients, before we rush into doing testing, if you are well and doing stuff and you don't actually need to know, because we're not starting treatment, do you really want to know? We all want to do medical tests and investigations and... You can imagine how medicine is. You can MRI a prostate gland. You can do a detail, the lipid profile. You do all these things, always wanting to know that you've got a good result. But the problem with testing and looking at human bodies, you find stuff and you don't always want to know the answer. And so it's something I do like to chat through with our patients. In terms of prognosis, we've got old-fashioned things, the Binet and Rice staging. These are old survival stats, very old. Look at that, 24 months average survival with a stage CCLR. We don't recognise those figures anymore. That's old data for when it first came along. But that stage, do you have more lymph nodes? What's your haemoglobin? Those are not as informative as the much more detailed molecular biology. And can we try and separate good CLL from bad CLL at the molecular level? There is so much chat about immunoglobulin variable heavy chain mutational status. Let me try and explain what all of that means. Chromosomal abnormalities and mutations of specific genes. Immunoglobulin mutation status. So Cambridge, of course, we invented DNA. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> he says, <laughs> riding on the back of the coattails, I should say, of brilliant people who've been in Cambridge. But the whole understanding of immunoglobulin rearrangements was all worked out here in Cambridge, probably about... I think it was all done uh, on the tennis court roadside, so literally about 200 metres from where we're standing. So to try and explain what all of this means, we all start with our fresh primitive B cells in the bone marrow. Those B cells are capable, theoretically, of recognising any pathogen. They come into the lymph nodes, so they circulate around the body. This is all normal biology. This has nothing to do with CLL at this stage. They go into the lymph node as a very immature B cell. Their immunoglobulins, so these are these clever proteins that recognize pathogens, those immunoglobulins are what we call unmutated, so they have not been refined in any way. And the amazing biology behind all of this is that as these immature B cells go through part of the lymph node that we call the germinal centre, those immunoglobulin chains get randomly chopped up. And if you're into maths, it's incredible the potential diversity you can get because they have different blocks of DNA within the immunoglobulin chain. And you randomly shuffle. It's not us, it's random biology. What's behind it, who knows? But it's randomly shuffled, and they have these clever enzymes that do it, that create new combinations, and it changes the structure of the protein. 
And because it's random, it means we can randomly recognise pathogens that arrive. So we all start off with an immunoglobulin chain, each B cell that could do anything. It's totally randomly shuffled. So the protein that comes out might look like that or look like this and like that. And it's waiting for a new pathogen. It's why we think if a completely new virus descended from outer space, landed on the human race, it wouldn't wipe us all out because of this whole randomness. Some people would actually randomly have an immune system that would recognise these invading pathogens. And that's called mutation of your immunoglobulin chains. And if it's a useful one, and the lymph node says, yep, that can see a bug, I like that one, that cell becomes a mature lymphocyte. So immature has unmutated immunoglobulins, mature B cells have mutated immunoglobulins. So it's a normal differentiation path. And CLL can actually <coughs> derive from those unmutated cells, so the primitive ones, or it can derive from the mutated, less primitive, these mature ones. And CLL is quite different between them. So unmutated CLL and mutated CLL. And these ones from the primitive, they divide more rapidly, they grow more. People often have more in the way of B symptoms. They're more proliferative. And we know with the old-fashioned treatments, they just didn't quite respond as well and they relapsed quicker. And they were much more enriched in the relapsed trials because people with unmutated CLL just traditionally have not maintained remissions as long enough. So they work through their treatments faster. And the mutated immunoglobulin CLLs, they're the complete opposite. These are the ones who will have people have disease that's stable for years. They can gradually progress, gradually get splenomegaly and these lymph nodes, but they're often just not that unwell. And it is important because you'll have some people see a lot and say, oh, I don't know what the fuss you're making out of this for 15 years. I'm fine, you know, I still go out and play golf. But of course, the diseases are actually quite different. And you could make an argument for separating CLL and coming up with a new name for these two different things because biologically they are quite different. And we've got old data sets that show us this. This is old-fashioned, old data from Terry Hamlin's group down in Bournemouth showing that the unmutated have this much shorter survival than patients with mutated CLR. So that's when you talk about immunoglobulins, you've got an IGHV unmutated or mutated. Now that might be quite a lot to get your head around if you're new to thinking about it, but the joy of it being online, you can work through that talk and have a bit of a think and make notes. We'll test you later. <laughs> Right, so that, that's IGHV. Then how about the chromosomes? In your clinic, and you might have seen on your clinic letters, you might have things like 13Q deleted, 11Q minus, trisomy 12. These are all referring to structural differences in our chromosomes. Now, every human cell, well, not every human cell, red cells don't have their DNA, but the vast majority of cells in our body have our DNA arranged into chromosomes. That DNA is in the nucleus, and we have our 22 chromosomes, and we have the sex chromosome. So this is a female XX. It's a bit small, so I can't test you chaps at the back, but here we've got three copies of 21, so trisomy 21. But a normal carrier type will have two copies of all of this, and that is what is normal. Now, in CLL, we've known for quite a long time that if you have abnormalities in the CLL, so this is not abnormalities in your bone marrow as in you as a, your normal, what we call hereditary uh, germline DNA, it's abnormalities in the leukaemia. So the leukaemia has picked up these abnormalities. And classics are deletion of 17P. So that's one you often th hear thrown around, which is one of our ones that tends to associate with a poorer response to treatments. So 17P deletion is something that we look for when we're treating people. And there are others, 13P, so 13Q, which tends to have a better survival. And the P stands for petite, so that's a short arm of chromosome. And the Q, I hmm, don't know, the long arm. <laughs> Trying to remember my O-level French on the spot. But the, the P is petite, so short arm, that's how I always remember it. So 17P is you have the deletion of the short arm. Trisomy 12, that means you've got three copies of chromosome 12 and then 11Q deletion. And we know biologically these all 
can behave a bit differently. We know trisomy 12 can associate with some mutations and perhaps a high risk of converting into this high-grade lymphoma. We know that 11 Qs tend to present with more bulky lymphadenopathy. We know that 13 Q can quite often have splenomegaly small volume lymph nodes. They can, they can behave a bit differently. And to a CLL clinic, when they're trying to plan your therapy, that might slightly influence how you are managed. And before any of the new drugs came along, we had really quite a separation in survival. So this is the 17P deleted patients. And this is from the German trials data. So you can see why we used to really get very nervous about finding a 17P deletion. But the world has changed quite a lot, and all of those curves are much better than they were. So I've talked about IGHV. I've talked about chromosomal abnormalities. And the third bit that can influence our thinking is the mutations of the genes themselves. So this is a bit of intensive molecular biology. There are 25,000 genes in our genome. A lot of them are housekeeper genes churning over the functions of the cell. And there are other genes that are critical to how the cells cycle, how they process dying material. And TP53 is one of these master genes in the body. It controls apoptosis and drives cells into cell death. That's what this term means, apoptosis. And if you have abnormalities in TP53, you don't kill off cells properly. You don't kill off abnormal cells. And that's why TP53 abnormalities are a recurring feature of cancers. Because if you don't kill off a cell that's gone wrong by randomness, because you know our cells are dividing all the time, we have billions of cell divisions in the body every day, and if there's a random mistake, normally the cell says, hello, something wrong there, that's a random mistake, I'm going to target that cell to die. But that targeting process requires a functional TP53 system. So if TP53 isn't working properly, your cells, the bad cells, have this tendency to accumulate. And if you give them treatments, chemotherapy particularly, it relies on chopping up DNA, making a cell a bad cell, and then the cell programs itself to die. That's how these drugs work. And so if TP53 isn't working well, you can give people chemotherapy, you can damage the cell, but it might not die, and it might hang on in there. And that's why TP53, across the board in cancer, is something that cancer doctors are always very interested in. And we look for mutations of TP53, that specific gene. And we do all of this by clever sequencing in the lab. But it is quite important to know that when you're trying to plan different therapies. TP53 is the gene that sits on 17P. So 17P deletion is missing that copy of TP53. And that's why 17P deletion is bad, because it means that you don't have TP53. That's a lot of molecular biology if you're not biologically orientated, but it is something you can reflect on. We can screen for many, many mutations. There are many different genes that could be mutated, and they can all feed into a complex equation. At the moment, that is not influencing practice in most patients. But we are building up a data set, and internationally, colleagues like Anna Hsu in Oxford are doing amazing work in trying to bring together how these things actually interplay in terms of prognosis and management. And for all I know, Next time I give the talk, I'll be saying, aha, we've got to map out mutations in genes A, B, C, because that means we should give you treatment Y. Because that is a bit of a direction of travel in cancer therapy. Wow, so that's a lot of time on trying to separate out these molecular things. So good, early stage, mutated IJHV. I seem to have lost my other bits, which were meant to be there. Oh, they've all hidden away. I've got schoolboy error. I've got my PowerPoint annotation wrong. Hmm. Anyway, hidden under there, <laughs> hidden under there is the good and the less good. A lot of the older prognostic marker information is less strongly applicable with newer therapies. That's a really important message. So before the new things came along, of course, unmutated IGHV with a 17P deletion and TP53 mutation on the other allele, that is not good. But with the newer drugs, actually, a lot of that old bad prognostic data is being a bit questioned because the new drugs 
tend to work in a different way, which we're going to come on to. When do you treat CLL? Oh, that is a difficult one, because with conventional therapy, CLL cannot be cured. And I say to patients, we've got to use those words, and of course it is a very challenging thing to hear. But I try to frame it, if you're north of 70, with the developments that we've got and everything, that actually statistically it is likely, you, very likely, you'll have your normal natural life expectancy and it'll be other things that take you away. Of course, 60 to 70, hopefully you can say the same thing, under 60 is more challenging. But, as I always say, the remarkable therapeutic advances we've had so far, and I know the things that are cooking in the research lab that's moving to the clinical lab, are going to have ongoing major impact in the next five, ten years. And if somebody in the clinic still looks glum, I say, take out your telephone. Look how different that is from the phone you had just five years ago. You know, all the world is moving on in technological advance. And you can tell that I'm always trying to give a bit of a positive spin, but I think it is important uh, to know that. But because we can't cure it, the international standard remains that if you are well you don't do anything. But the watch and wait, the wait and worry, you hear all of these things. It is, it is very difficult. You come in, you sit with someone like me who says, you've got leukaemia and we're going to do nothing. <laughs> so you hear this thing. You hear some patients who go, fantastic, amazing. I was dreading having had chemo and you've cheered me up immensely. And they walk out of the room and you think, <coughs> where are all my messages <laughs> landing there? <laughs> Skip out and go, brilliant. Um, you then hear this one, how can you leave my cancer? It's just going to get worse. This is crazy. <coughs> and of course, I get second opinion referrals, and it's not that uncommon. I'll get somebody who says, I saw a doc in wherever, and he said, the last thing you want to do is treat me. And I, So we repeat the conversations, all messaging. Is this the NHS saving money? <laughs> of course. That's, I'd say, a one in five comment. I say, why aren't you treating me? Is it? <laughs> of course. And I put here the passage of time because actually it's quite interesting over the last 20 years, the general feeling I have that sometimes the most adamant treat me now people, time passes, people settle in. I always say it takes four months, maybe even six months to get your head around the concept that actually there is something there and it needs a bit of working through. But these people who are often quite keen to be treated early, when they've got the head around it, when it comes to four or five years, and I'm going, well, you know, you've lost a bit of weight, the lymph nodes are more prominent, I think we should now be thinking about treatment, they will often go, not for me, <laughs> not for me, I've done fine for five years, I'm not having any of the poisons. And, uh, you know, so people can change, that passage of time can influence how people think. And of course, as clinicians, we've got to be very flexible, we're there for the patient, and so everyone is different and everyone has different views of their cancer. Supportive care. Keep fit, look out for infections, act early. If they're recurrent, seek referrals. Some of our patients are on prophylactic antibiotics, some are on uh, immunoglobulin replacements. There are all sorts of things you can do um, with recurrent things. Vaccinations, remember you're not allowed to have live vaccines. There are cases clearly that people have had a live yellow fever or a live shingles and become quite unwell with it. So that remains the standard advice. Pneumococcus, Shingrix now, that's the uh, shingles vaccine. For a long time, you could only get that if you paid for it, but now that is NHS approved if you're immunocompromised. Uh, oh, my goodness, I didn't put COVID on there. <laughs> COVID vaccines, have your COVID vaccines. So I've deliberately not put slides in about COVID because I think it's probably going to come up in a conversation, but have the vaccines. I know CLL patients don't vaccinate brilliantly, but there is, and I'm not a, an immunologist, I just look at what's talked about, and there is evidence of T-cell responses. And of course, COVID, which was devastating for a lot of our CLL patients early on, is less devastating now. I'm saying that in broad terms. Of course, there are individuals still who have a torrid time with COVID, but it is not quite how it was. And a lot of us think vaccination has helped. So we believe in that. I was going to have Evershield on there. Oh my goodness, that's controversy. I removed it. If anyone wants to bring it up in conversation, happy to discuss. So non-chemotherapy approaches, vitamin D, vitamin D goes in and out of phase, green tea, and these I had in my talk when I gave this talk last time. So vitamin D and cancer, 
Vitamin D deficiency is not good for human beings. I think we can probably agree on that. It's, there are various, even multiple sclerosis has been linked to low levels of vitamin D. And I have a vitamin D pot at home in the kitchen. I tell the children, remember to take your vitamin D. I try and remember to take one. In fact, I saw my wife had put it from the 10 micrograms. We've now got the 25s using Tesco's. And, you know, some people think if you're vitamin D deficient February, March, you're a bit grumpy and a bit slow. And I noticed the strength increase. I didn't know whether it was a secret message to me. <laughs> take a bit more vitamin D. Anyway, but you mustn't overdose vitamin D. Remember, it affects calcium metabolism, and don't start shoveling the stuff in and think it's uh, uh, nirvana. Vitamin D deficiency, does it have worse cancer outcomes, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. But when I gave the talk in March 2019, this paper had just been published, and it was looking at 25,000 randomised cancers, random, sorry, randomised individuals to vitamin D or no vitamin D, and they found no difference in cancer outcomes. And it's always a reminder with medical statistics, you can get some smaller studies that can say definitely A is better than B or something else. And then you can do another study and say, you know, sometimes B is better than A, other way around. But I, I think the jury is out. The CLL data is this that Tate Scharnefeld published a number of years ago, which showed that people who are vitamin D deficient, Americans, I say, is vitamin D deficient, seem to progress to treatment and they seem to possibly have inferior overall survivals. It's really difficult looking at US population data because anything that co-associates with poorer or lower socioeconomic class tends to have lower uh, inferior health outcomes in the long term. So we note it. I, I don't think it is wrong taking vitamin D. Green tea is a bit more controversial because Again, lots of studies looking at this if people have higher dietary flavonoid intakes, and I am not uh, a dietitian. There's studies are giving loads of green tea, and that is, that is trying to show how many cups of green tea you'd have to, to get these doses of this polyphenol E, and possibly it reduces size of the lymph nodes and lymphocyte count. Does that actually help in the long term? I don't know, and I always put this... 2018 BBC, the food supplement that ruined my liver. So this poor chap decided retiring, he was getting himself fit and he was taking loads of green tea capsules and he finished off his liver. Because green tea, those, they are drugs, remember, they can have side effects and he was, ended up managing to damage himself and needed a liver transplant. So it's just a salutary reminder that just be a little bit careful before you are online and you find the holy grail of, you know, bark of a tree from South America, eat this, it's only $50 a month. Everybody is a little bit vulnerable uh, in this type of situation. So we talked a bit about this, about when treatment was needed, night sweats, lethargy, weight loss, troublesome lymph nodes, blood parameters. So treating CLL. We're about to head on to the new slides. Quarter past 11. We're doing okay for time. Chemotherapy, monoclonal antibodies, BTK inhibitors, I'm going to talk about these different things, and BCL2 inhibitors. Chemo. Chemo is the old-fashioned stuff. The basic principle of chemotherapy is it hits dividing cells. So these are chemicals that interfere with DNA. When your cell divides, it has to make a new set of DNA. And if you put in drugs that mess up the chemical signals, cross-link the DNA substituting chemicals where it shouldn't be a normal thing, it makes those dividing cells die off. And it's classically why, if you're giving high-dose chemotherapy, your hair falls out, because your hair follicles are dividing cells, and they can't divide and make new cells. You get diarrhoea, you get ulcers, you get all of this inflammation, because chemotherapy stops those gut cells dividing. Our gut cells are dividing constantly. It's a constant renewal thing going on. Your nails get bad, they fall off, because they're dividing. Skin problems. So that's how chemotherapy works. It's a very non-specific thing. Antibodies. Abinutuzumab is widely used in treating people with CLL. It's one of these antibodies that binds onto the surface. So antibodies are nearly always infused, sometimes given as a subcutaneous. You can't take a tablet antibody. Well, there are some clever chaps in Cambridge who have got some IP on that new technology. So it's a bit of a watch this space. But at the moment, you have to inject and infuse antibodies. Antibodies are big molecules. 
They're not like chemo, which are chemicals, and small molecule inhibitors, which are these complex little structures. Antibodies are enormous. And they circulate around the blood, go into the lymph nodes, and bind onto the CLL cells. They recognize specific proteins. So these are monoclonal antibodies. They're made in the laboratory. They're made with a very specific attack structure. They latch onto the CLL cell and they target that CLL for death. And we know that monoclonal antibodies work beautifully with other compounds, so we combine them. So monoclonal antibodies in CLL are actually very uncommonly given on their own. We nearly always combine them because it adds an extra kick to the killing effect. But understanding the biology of CLL has really driven development of new therapies. And at the beginning, when Mark introduced me, he said, as part of the CLL Forum, and one of the great things the CLL Forum does, and I've been involved with it for 15 years, but it brings the scientists and the clinicians and the patients together. And it works really well bringing that trio together. And the scientists, these guys, do really amazing stuff working out the biology behind all of this and why CLL cells live and survive. And this is a bit small for you lot at the back, but this is a CLL cell. And CLL cells, they live in the microenvironment. They get boosted in the lymph nodes, in the boma and the spleen. They circulate around. They speak to the microenvironment and get all of these activation signals. And they go out into the blood. And oddly enough, the cells in the blood tend to be in a fairly switched off state. And it's when they circulate round, because they're living things, they go around into your lymph node, get a little bit of an activation, and then come out again. And CLL loves to live in that microenvironment, and it takes signals from the microenvironment down through its cell surface proteins, and they go via BTK. And that signaling is essential for these cells to survive. And interrupting that whole signaling process is a key to how our new drugs are working. And BTK inhibitors that I'm going to be talking about are designed to specifically target that point. And when I'm trying to describe it to patients, I say, imagine you're in a room and the light is the cancer. And chemo is that builder comes in, a bit cheap, works 20 quid an hour with his hammer and he's smashing around the room and he might well hit the light. You might hit the light beautifully. But a targeted inhibitor is you come in and you switch off the light switch. Now that's a bit of a sort of descriptive thing, but it's trying to illustrate the point that the targeted inhibitors are trying to look at where the problem is that's driving that CLL to activate, grow, divide and switch it off. And of course, ideally limit the bashing in the room. Now, of course, that's far too simplistic because when you're switching off the light switch, you're doing it with a big hand and you tend to hit other things a bit as well, as we'll talk about. But BTK inhibitors have revolutionized how we treat CLL. And the other thing is BCL2 inhibitors and venetoclax is the characteristic drug we're using at the moment for that. Now, BCL2 is this master regulator of apoptosis. Apoptosis is the word I used earlier to describe cell death. Cells have to die. It's part of normal biology. When your gut cells are growing and dividing, the old ones die off. When any cell that's getting towards its useful end, it dies off. And that's this constant processing. It's putting the bins out. Our body is doing that all the time. And we die off through these very regulated processes called apoptosis. BCL2 is this master regulator that switch off apoptosis. And BCL2 is really elevated in CLL. You look in the bone marrow and you stain for it, and it, CLL cells are full of BCL2, and there's a lot of biology behind why they are. And the amazing, there's a brilliant story, you can make a film from it, of these guys, this particular chap at Abbott Laboratories in Chicago, and the development of venetoclax and this drug that inhibits BCL2 and it's a really complex set of chemistry and it took them years of doing really clever things and folding these proteins around to try and get them to slot into this 
part of the molecule called the BH3 bit, the BH3 domain, and they call them BH3 mimetics, that they slot in and inhibit BCL2. So BCL2 is saying, don't die, don't die. You're a CLL cell. You've got lots of this. You mustn't die. Keep dividing, keep dividing. Then you throw in venetoclax. It locks in and it inhibits this master don't die <coughs> protein. So your cells start to die. And venetoclax is a remarkably powerful CLL drug, which we'll be touching on when we talk through therapeutics. So it's understanding the biology has allowed the scientists and the biotech world and pharma to develop these drugs, which have changed so much. This is too small. So much has changed since 2019 when I last gave this talk. So every slide from now on is new. It's taken me. Actually, that's a long time to get to where everything is new. <laughs> We're going to move through the therapeutics and then we'll have time for discussion. So when you have a patient in front of you, you must always think, when you're choosing a thing, I always think of this triangle and I say to my registrars, you never go wrong if you don't remember, if you don't forget your triangle. Patient factors. Old, young, fit, dynamic, unwell, frail, organ function, kidneys working, liver problems, heart problems, all of those patient things. Medication factors, are they on other drugs? Do they, does A interact with B? Have they had previous treatment that will influence your current treatment, etc., etc.? And then disease-specific factors. In CLL, we think about TP53, IGHV, all of those things. And you've got to put those three things together to try and come up with optimal uh, treatment. I guess you could put in the middle availability of drugs, but I could um, or put that as medication factors. So BTK inhibitors... We have got three different BTK inhibitors now that are approved in the UK to treat CLL. We've got acalabrutinib. We've got zanubrutinib. And we now have ibrutinib. Now, the reason I've crowded this slide and put them all together is these are all trials of BTK inhibitors against chemo. And with every trial, the BTK inhibitor has given a longer remission than the chemotherapy. It's a very consistent point. And BTK inhibitors are tablets, so without doubt, if you're saying, actually, that first remission is a priority to me, I want to be in a longer remission, you would always choose a BTK inhibitor over chemotherapy. We've now got second generation BTK inhibitors. So some of you in this room might be taking ibrutinib, but some of you previously might have taken ibrutinib. But ibrutinib actually can hit lots of different kinases. It's not quite a targeted drug. It is an amazing drug, and it has clearly saved the lives of many, many CLL patients. But the new ones that have come along, acalabrutinib, zanabrutinib, they have a much tighter, what we call a kinase profile, and they tend to have better side effects. Now, many people on ibrutinib don't have side effects. They're taking it. And it's a big thing to say to someone, look, you're doing really well on this drug, but I'm going to change you. Because you've got to ask the question, are you sure they're going to benefit from that change? But if you're starting someone from the beginning, it's, I think, in the UK practice, because we can get access to acalabrutinib. Zanabrutinib isn't currently approved NHS. Uh, it, 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 is, it, is, it is labelled, so in the private sector, people are using it. But I think you would probably choose a second-generation one. This is the detailed plot of the trial of acalabrutinib. So acalabrutinib plus abinutuzumab is a very effective regimen, but the way NHS funding is worked out and the way NICE look at drugs, that combination, acalabrutinib plus abinutuzumab, was not looked at by NICE, and it is quite complicated, and it won't be looked at by NICE. So the... So the Standard monotherapy acalabrutinib is what is approved. It is a great drug. It's very effective. Uh, and I'm sure many people in this room and people listening online would have been started on that drug. Poorer risk genetic patients. The one thing we've seen is with these newer drugs, these are the unmutated IGHVs, they do much better than they used to do with chemo. It's this recurring theme, and it's probably because of the way these signaling molecules work, they're actually downstream of the B-cell receptor signaling that is a key part of how unmutated CLLs work. It's all complex biology, but there's probably a good reason as to why they work well. And even the 17P deleted, this is progression-free survival, not overall, but you've got 70% of patients at five years still in a remission on their acalabrutinib. 
Those are really quite strikingly good statistics compared to the old days. There are side effects. BTK inhibitors have this constant question about cardiac side effects, and that's the biggest difference between ibrutinib and the new drugs. Because this risk of atrial fibrillation, the risk of more serious ventricular events, that's when the main pumping muscle runs into problems, they are clearly higher with the first generation than the second generation drugs. And these are plots looking at atrial fibrillation and, and hypertension. So that, that's ibrutinib and the bottom line is acalabrutinib. So the newer drugs are basically cleaner in terms of these side effects. So this summary of beta inhibitors, they're effective. They treat the high risk groups very well. And generally, the second generation drugs are what we use. But BTK inhibitors do not clear out the bone marrow. They don't put people into these very deep remissions. People can take them for years and feel completely well. And if you're 72 and you just want to take some tablets and be completely well, you're just not fussed about whether or not you've cleared every last cell in your bone marrow. You might have a different view if you're 52 from 72. But CLL, normally with BTK inhibitors, responds beautifully, lymph nodes shrink, people feel well but you don't clear out the marrow. <coughs> that leads us to venetoclax. So venetoclax, this remarkable drug, a first-in-class drug, the appeal. <coughs> venetoclax drives apoptosis, and it can quite commonly induce these deep remissions. The tragedy in the development period <coughs> with venetoclax is a couple of patients died just given a single dose of 200 milligrams of venetoclax because it is so powerfully effective. And that's why anyone starting venetoclax treatment the world over now has to take 20 milligrams for a week, then 50 milligrams for a week, then 100 milligrams for a week, then 200 milligrams for a week, then 400 milligrams. And it's the biggest pain of using venetoclax is you say to patients, you know, for the first couple of months, we really take over your life because you're up and down having blood tests, we're checking the kidneys and the body's biochemistry. How is that patient's body coping with the venetoclax? And the vast majority of patients are fine when you take it up very slowly. But it is a very, very powerful drug. You can't possibly just go in and give someone 200 or 400 milligrams from day one. Extremely dangerous. But nobody would do that. But the appeal that if you have a drug that can clear out the bone marrow, that is going to permit these fixed duration treatment strategies. So you can say, look, we're going to treat you for one year clear out the marrow, then step away. And that's what the Germans have been developing. And so the Germans have done these amazingly good trials. They are really robust, solid trials where they randomise people. In this trial, the CLL14, patients got either a year of chlorambucil plus abinutuzumab, so that's old chemo plus abinutuzumab, or venetoclax plus abinutuzumab. So new drug, beautiful trial, exactly weighted. And this huge benefit for the new drug over the old chemo. And many patients taking venetoclax abinutuzumab after you've got over the hurdle of the first month or two that can be a bit hairy for various reasons and there may well be patients in the room who've had a, an interesting time going through that first month or two. But when you get out of the other side you can have these very long remissions. Slightly frustratingly and disgust, that dotted line that you can't see at the back is referring to those with unmutated IGHV. The, the venetoclax-treated patients with unmutated IGHV, they still got very long remissions, and I, don't, I really don't want to turn around and say it's inappropriate at all. And we have many young people treated with unmutated IGHV who get venetoclax abinutuzumab, do very well, and you've got five, six-year remissions. But it does seem that they seem to have this slightly higher risk, relapse risk than the mutated. That's the overall survival, looking really good. It looks as if it's starting to separate. So patients who got the new drug up front may well have a better overall survival. The Germans have applied a similar but different logic with their younger patients and say, OK, we know that time-limited therapy is what a lot of young people want. Let's crank it up even further and let's add ibrutinib to the mix. So they're now taking all three of our most effective drugs abinutuzumab, venetoclax, and a BTK inhibitor, and putting all three together. And this data was presented last year in this trial. 
And they showed that, in, yes, indeed, you can clear the bone marrow. Look at that. 78% of patients who were given that triplet cleared their bone marrow of all CLL. That's a deep remission. But venetoclax with abinutuzumab, that combination, which I would like to stress is NHS approved, and we can give that, that cleared 72% of the bone marrow. So that's still a pretty impressive number of patients got these very deep remissions. And when you track them over time, the relapse rates really are very low. But that black line is the triplet, and the red line is what we can do with what we have already, venetoclax and venetuzumab. And you've got to ask yourself, is it really worth throwing in the BTK inhibitor? Because you definitely had extra side effects. And we keep having this slightly residual question that if you use all your weapons up front, is that the best thing? Don't you want to keep a BTK inhibitor that your CLL has never seen, keep it in reserve to deploy it later? And a lot of CLL experts who I'm involved with on various international meetings and things, a lot of them pause before we think this triplet therapy is a really good thing. We've got to be really sure patients are going to benefit because it definitely does have more side effects. And we're not yet sure the data is dramatically better. Unmutated IGHV, still doing really well, but you can see not quite as good as a mutated. So it does look with venetoclax that that old-fashioned prognosis thing is kicking a little bit. But how about combining just your BTK inhibitor and your venetoclax? Let's leave the antibody to one side and why not combine the two? And multiple trials have been done doing that. And I'm looking around the room to see if any of my trials patients are in who have been in this trial because there's one trial that we were running in our trials group here in Cambridge, this GLOW study of ibrutinib and venetoclax, and that's working through the NICE process. So it's approved in the UK, so there are some people getting treatment in the private sector, but we're hoping NICE will give this NHS approval later this year. It was older patients. They were randomised. Sorry, this is a trial thing. So ibrutinib, venetoclax, or the standard chemo arm. And when you look at what we call progression-free survival, so you're asking the question, how many people down here, three, four, four years are in remission? Three quarters. So pretty good data. Not staggeringly good data, but pretty good data. Whereas the chemo arm drops off. Those of you who are scientifically minded will say, how can you suddenly have a quarter of all of your patients relapsing at exactly the same time point? And that's because we do CT scans in commercial trials. You have to constantly define your remission status. And people who had chemotherapy, commonly their lymph nodes have started to grow. doesn't mean they're ill and needing treatment, but that's a relapse point. So ibrutinib venetoclax is categorically better in terms of progression-free survival. A mutated IGHV, slightly dropping off the curve. Again, it returns to that question mark with these unmutated is time-limited therapy, and is venetoclax optimal for those patients? These are big open questions, and I'm just throwing it there because we don't know the real answer to that. So much data, and we are just about at the end. The one point with the GLOW trial that we are all debating internationally is this slightly strange survival curve because this is asking the question how many people are alive, and ibrutinib venetoclax had this slightly strange thing that most of the deaths in that arm happened early on with treatment. These were older patients. They were frail. Ibrutinib venetoclax comes with quite a collection of extra side effects, and there were deaths. Big international trial. Quite a few of those deaths were in other healthcare economies, but there were deaths early on, whereas the chemo deaths all happened later. Quite a lot of those deaths were infections, and we're not really sure, but it's a strange-looking survival curve. So ibrutinib and venetoclax as a combination is appealing, and for some patients it will be the right answer. But for many patients, and I do suspect the older, less fit, they may well simply be better served by just taking their BTK inhibitor on its own and keeping venetoclax for later. So you see how our world is changing. We're getting all of this data, and it does make it a little bit more complicated. 
but it means we have lots of things, hopefully in the cupboard, to keep offering people. And a lot of the discussions we have in the clinic is fixed duration versus treat to progression. If you treat someone for a year, there are advantages, aren't there? The psychological advantages, you can say, you know what, we've got starting in March, by next March 24, you're going to be off treatment, hopefully in remission, and then you can forget about us. You're not still taking stuff. Theoretically, you reduce the chances of resistance because you say you're only on it for a year, then you're off. So your disease is less likely to become resistant to these drugs. So hopefully we can use them again in the future. And if you have mutated IGHV, then definitely you'd be really thinking about venetoclax and that type of thing. The cons of fixed duration. Well, you've got the complete opposite psychological thing. Some people say, oh my goodness, I'm really well. The idea of stopping my therapy fills me with horror. Uh, I just want to take the tablets and keep going. So it's quite interesting. You can have that psychology working either direction. Fixed duration, because of venetoclax, one of the challenges is those early side effects. And for some people who are a bit frail or you're worried about blood pressure or reactions or the patient doesn't want infusions, they don't want to be up and down to the day unit, that's a big disadvantage. You might be 73 and think, the last thing I want to do is spend the next two months up and down having infusions, being unwell. And so you've got to debate that with the patient. And then biologically, there is this whole debate about cancer resistance. If you treat a cancer and you suppress it and you keep it suppressed, biologically, it might have less evolved resistance because you're keeping the clone really small and it's a growing clone that's dividing with a bigger bulk of clone that might get genetic resistance because it's all a random thing. So BTK, ongoing, keep the clone really small, that might be better for cancer resistance. But of course, the counter-argument is Darwinian evolution. If you're constantly exposing that CLL to your drug over years, over years, then the CLL will mutate and get resistant and start to grow up because it simply grows through that drug you're still on. So you have these two competing cancer resistance arguments, and we've definitely been able to show the mutations that stop BTK working. We can map them in the lab. But the amazing stuff is we have new BTK inhibitors called the non-covalent ones that bypass that resistance spot. So we've got another drug in the cupboard that's coming out fairly soon. It's in the trials clinics. So beyond BTK, we really are almost at the end. <laughs> Biotech and pharma, they love targeting the BTK molecule because it's a very clean target. We've validated it now. Hundreds of thousands of people around the world have taken BTK inhibitors and, you know, their ears aren't falling off. They do keep living. They're not having unexpected side effects predominantly. So it's a lovely target to work for. And the cleaner your inhibitor, the fewer and fewer side effects you're going to have. So that's why there's a lot more development ongoing. And this amazing drug coming along, pertubrutinib, which works. Look at these people. These are people who were resistant. Many of these were resistant to ibrutinib. So the dark blue lines, resistant to ibrutinib, and the light blue lines, people who couldn't tolerate ibrutinib. And this is looking at the lymph nodes and how they shrank going on this new tablet pertubrutinib in the trial. Amazing. And that's working through the trial program, and that drug will be coming available fairly soon. This is my first patient who went on it. You got to light your CT scans, big spleen, big lymph nodes, little spleen. No lymph nodes. 17P deleted, relapsing on ibrutinib. Just takes these new tablets. Everything disappears. Feels well. Looking around, see if she's here. <laughs> so our ability to treat CLL is amazing, but we haven't really advanced our ability to treat the immune failure. There are still patients who have progressed through multiple lines of therapy. I have not talked about all of these targeted antibody toxins, bispecifics, bite, CAR T-cell, holy grail, allogeneic transplant. In this room, there is an amazing patient of mine who has gone through every drug, every trial, to and from Oxford in one of their additional trials, has had an allogeneic transplant, and is amazing. I'm not going to embarrass who he is, but he knows how good his bone marrow was last week. Totally clear. Amazing. And yet, 
We don't use allogeneic transplant very often, but it's there as a very powerful tool. And you can give a whole talk on how allogeneic transplant has really changed. When I was a junior, you know, at least 25% of people died and had torrid times of transplant. But of course, all of their technologies and tools and everything get better. So that is there as well. Wow, 70 <laughs> slides. So I know, and Lewis rightly emailed me and said, that's too many slides. <laughs> of course. But the idea is, because this will be online, and you can use it as a bit of an educational resource, and you can sort of go into it, have a bit of a read, come out of it. Uh, and anyway, so that gives us half an hour of questions, Mark, if that's all right. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you.